good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to everyone. I'm Peter Bernstein. I'm the senior editor for TMCNet.com, and I am delighted to be the moderator for today's webinar, Cloud-Based Software Licensing, Enabling Operational Efficiency, Delighted Customers, and Sustainable Competitive Advantage. I'm truly delighted to be joined today by my old friend Jeff Kaplan, Managing Director of Think Strategies, and Jam Said Jam Khan, Director of Professional Services for Gamalto. However, before I introduce Jeff and Jam, a little background is in order. There can be no disputing that we live in an increasingly always-on and always ALLWAYS connected world where software centricity has become a major, if not the major, driver of not just current value, but sustainable differentiated value. And on top of this has been what I call the next phase of the digital era, the age of acceleration, where the only certainties are change and the speed at which is it increasing. It's an age where a premium will be on the agility to respond rapidly to the preferences of individuals and organizations looking for customized solution. And to paraphrase the famous Mark Andreessen line from his Wall Street Journal op-ed in 2011, software may not be eating the world, but those who fail to properly harness its powers will be consumed. Indeed, driven by all of the big trends we read about almost daily, the cloud, mobility, globalization, social media, security, etc., getting a handle on how best to accommodate change and optimally monetize the value of all that software that is foundational to almost everything we do personally and professionally has become mission critical. This becomes especially true as we move away from perpetual software license models where software was delivered on physical media. The facts are that the world is becoming ever cloudier. In the next few years, all of the applications and services we use will be cloud-friendly from the start. The vast majority will be accessed through private, public, and hybrid cloud environments, and the cloud, thanks to the software, is seemingly eating the world. In this cloud-driven world, the challenge for creators of software and those who are transforming to make software the centerpiece of their differentiated and sustainable value is how to best monetize the almost breathless pace of market change. The short answer, considering the need for software providers and their customers alike to have visibility and control over how software is delivered, packaged, priced, updated, and used, is having a cloud-based licensing and entitlement solution in place. Such a solution provides the three things software-centric organizations need to be successful, product differentiation, operational excellence, and customer intimacy. How cloud a based licensing and entitlement management software monetization solutions can help your organization create sustainable differentiated value, be more operationally efficient and effective, and ultimately create more loyal customers uh, based on exponential increases in responsiveness is what our presenters are about to detail, including a sneak preview of a book that Gamalto is publishing, uh, a, a white paper by Jeff uh, that he's going to detail in his presentation. Now, before turning the session over to Jeff and Jam, I'd like to go over a few administrative details. We have a lot of time for Q&A at the end of the session, but make sure that you ask the questions when they're top of mind instead of just waiting for the Q&A to begin. We're going to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can, and any that we're unable to answer will be archived, and our presenters will be happy to answer them offline following today's event. With that said, we're going to dispense with long introductions and get right to the heart of the matter. Jeff? turn the wheel over to you. Hey, well, thanks, Peter. I'm glad we finally got ourselves on track here. And um, it is a pleasure to be with both you and all the folks who have uh, joined us on this webinar. And what I want to do is spend some time putting some of those trends that you just talked about uh, into context, because many of the folks on this call may recall a book that was published over 20 years ago now. And I think we're all dating ourselves if we do re remember this book, but it was a great one. It had to do with the disciplines of market leaders. And in this book, the authors suggested that there were three areas where companies could possibly lead in their respective markets, in the product uh, leadership and product differentiation area, in the operational excellence area, uh, or in the customer intimacy area. But the most important point that they wanted to make was that you could only choose one of the three. That is, there were very few, if any, companies who could excel in more than one area, and no company 
would be able to excel in all three. So what they were proposing was that in order to succeed, you had to pick your spot or pick your strategy among these three. Now back then, that idea made a, made a lot of sense, and this was a very popular book among a lot of uh, executives. However, we believe that in today's brave new world of the cloud that Peter was talking about, there is an opportunity, in fact, to excel in all three areas. And, in fact, the leaders in this industry are, in fact, doing just that. They are achieving a balance in which they're finding an interdependency, if you will, uh, in fact, even a leveraging opportunity across each of these three disciplines. And I want to spend some time talking about why this is happening, how this is happening, and why it's important to you. The first thing is about the perfect storm that we're all experiencing, whether we're in the technology industry or in um, another industry trying to take advantage of technology. And again, as Peter pointed out, the ability to become more software-driven uh, and, in fact, become software vendors. The first piece in this perfect storm is a change in customer attitudes. Again, as Peter alluded to, we live in an on-demand world, and more and more organizations, as well as end users and executives, want um, hardware, software, and product functionality at their fingertips in order to um, meet their day-to-day -day needs. And in an increasingly competitive environment, uh, they also want to be able to um, respond to new competitive pressures uh, and be able to um, do so in a cost-effective fashion. Now, the fortunate thing is that uh, there are new technological innovations in the form of the cloud that uh, enable them to uh, come to market in a different fashion and then to take advantage of economies in a different way. So technological innovations and um, new capabilities, and I'm going to let Marcy uh, push this forward because for some reason the, the slides are not working for me. But one more click here, Marcy, and we'll play out the new economics of this marketplace and uh, then move on to the next slide and talk about how this perfect storm is translating into uh, new opportunities in this marketplace. First of all, let's talk about the change, changing landscape. And if you click uh, three times here, Marcy, we could talk about uh, what's happening. Uh, number one, of course, we've got competition that's growing because of the lowering barriers to entry. Jeff, you have controls uh, now. You should have controls. Sorry. Hit the button. Uh, let's see if it works. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. No worries. All right. So the first thing is uh, a growing competition with the lowering of barriers to entry. And the second thing is the increased um, power of the consumer, whether that's an end user or even a business executive who, uh, again, is demanding the availability of applications and services on demand. The goal, of course, is to be able to better target our goods and services to better meet the needs of customers. And what we have at our disposal to do that, of course, is the cloud. The cloud gives us greater connectivity. It gives us a, a compute power on demand. It gives us infinite storage capabilities and capacity. And, of course, it does so in an economic resource sharing fashion that allows us to obtain that functionality and, and all the powers that come with it at a, a more economical price. But the real innovation in, in all of this is the on and off capability. That is the elasticity, which enables organizations to gain greater economies, more agility, and ultimately be able to manage these resources more effectively to meet their business objectives. Now, the, the manifestation of all of this, of course, is applications on demand. And there's no better place to find those applications, of course, than at our fingertips with the mobile devices that are now at our disposal. And those mobile devices and the, the um, 
functionality that comes with them have set a new standard for what we expect when it comes to software and the availability of the functionality that that software represents. It also is combined not only with the cloud, but with the rapid evolution of nanotechnology, which again is making uh, sensor technology available for literally a penny on the dollar. So the combination of sensors and connectivity and storage all can have combined to create this vast new world referred to as the Internet of Things. And really the Internet of Things is the convergence of two previous ideas. The first being the idea of the machine-to-machine -machine world, which has taken hold over the past decade or so within the industrial uh, space. And more recently, the idea of digital marketing, which of course has been aimed at the consumer world. When you bring these two ideas together and you combine them with the ability to add sensors to almost anything, of course what you see is a universe of connected things that is exploding. No matter what survey you read, no matter what forecast you see, you will find that the curve will be dramatically up and to the right. And whether it's a survey from strategy analytics, as you see here, or the other market research firms uh, that follow this space, they're all projecting dramatic growth in these connected things. But more importantly, they're all expecting that these things will be managed and manipulated by software. It is the software that adds the intelligence to these things and enables them to, in fact, communicate uh, with each other and with the um, users of those things as well as the vendors of those things. And as Peter alluded to, here's the article that uh, of course changed people's thinking about all of this. The idea that software would not necessarily be eating the world but in fact would be embedded in, in everything across the world landscape. And that has obviously manifested itself over the past five years or so in the automobile industry, uh, within the home, and even within the healthcare uh, industry. All of which has not only been shaped by software, but has been enabled by the cloud. And as the cloud has become more pervasive and as software has become more sophisticated, it has even dramatically changed the nature of business by creating new business models. Not only subscription service models, but of course the most dramatic change has come in the shared services economy. Uh, and that is dramatically affecting a number of different industries. But of course, behind all of this is software. And the most important aspect of that software is making it as usable and as user-friendly as possible so that the customer experience can be one that um, uh, satisfies their expectations and meets their specific needs, whether it be consumer needs or um, enterprise needs. And what the folks at Gardner have been estimating or forecasting is that more and more marketeers are going to be focused on that customer experience. That in addition to the raw functionality, it's all about how that functionality is delivered um, as an end user experience. So with that in mind, of course, we come back to the basic premise. And that is that the world has changed in such a way that you no longer need to make a choice between the three disciplines that were outlined in the book uh, back in 2000, I'm sorry, 1995. But in fact, if you want to be a market leader, you want to become proficient in all three areas. And there's probably no better uh, example of that than Salesforce.com, who has innovated in terms of product design with its multi-tenant design of its software as a service offering. In terms of customer intimacy, it's been able to attain uh, tremendous customer satisfaction and success, which has resulted in high renewal levels and add-on and cross-sales capabilities. And in terms of efficiency, of course, that's translated in the ability of the company 
to grow dramatically and to scale profitably, even though it may not be showing that profit because it's reinvesting in the growth engine uh, in order to grab share in this fast-moving environment. So what Salesforce is proving is that it is possible to, to succeed in all three disciplines. But they're not alone. There are other companies who are also trying to demonstrate this. Uh, Amazon, of course, is demonstrating it through its product innovation, uh, not only with its Dash consumer-oriented services, but with its AWS or Amazon Web Services. Um, and what it's been able to do with that product innovation is gain greater customer intimacy and, of course, achieve a greater level of operational efficiency. Um, at the same time, what we're seeing is new companies who are focusing in on new ways to gain customer intimacy through software as well. And I happen to be a, um, a cyclist, and while all of cyclists with mustaches look alike, I can assure you I have never done what this guy is doing. I don't usually wear a suit and tie as I'm riding my bike, um, and I certainly wouldn't be doing it without a helmet, and I wouldn't be doing it while I'm looking at my smartphone. But leaving that aside, what I do is use a software application called Strava, which does allow me to track my rides, but more importantly allows the users of Strava on the other side of the screen, so to speak, to better understand my needs, to better understand my preferences, to better understand my behavior, and to better understand you know, when I may be at risk, not only about being hit by a car in this position, but more importantly, whether I might be at risk of actually not using their application any longer because I've decided I want to go elsewhere. And therefore, they might be concerned about where I might go next and want to anticipate that. So it's that software which allows Strava and other companies serving our individual needs to better understand you know, how we use that application because they can track every keystroke and the movement of those applications as well. And in industries like the automobile industry and others, that software is helping them, in fact, to change the end-to-end -end business processes to create greater um, efficiency, to create greater responsiveness, and to create uh, greater uh, profitability in the end. But it's not only about you know, changing the business process. It's, in fact, changing the nature of the product itself. So while that car may have been viewed as a, a standalone product five or ten years ago, uh, increasingly, of course, it's viewed as a part of a business solution in the form of Uber, let's say. But more importantly, it's going to be viewed as an information service because of the data that it's generating. And there's a good friend of ours here in the Boston area named Tom Davenport, who's been focused on data analytics since before it became popular. And the reason he's smiling is, of course, we're all talking about analytics today. But he's pointing out that the reality that most of us also are feeling, which is, like it or not, we're all in the data business. But the reality underneath that is that we all are increasingly becoming part of the software economy because it is the software that controls all of these steps of the process. And here are three more examples of companies who are redefining themselves using software and redefining the disciplines of market leaders in the same way. Uh, the first is Philips uh, Lighting, who have faced the commoditization of the lighting industry um, and have changed their focus and changed their go to market strategy and have become a managed service provider providing managed lighting services that are software enabled and delivered. And then there's Emerson who is in the um, of course heating and cooling business but now they refer to themselves as being in the comfort services business and that's controlled by software again. And then finally uh, folks at John Deere who have recognized that as their uh, tractors and other um, heavy-duty equipment become more reliable and therefore their lifespans are becoming longer and longer, the information being generated from those sensor-based um, vehicles are now, that information is now becoming more and more important to the users than the, the um, vehicles themselves, if you will. And they are now becoming more of an information services company. 
again, all powered by software. And all three of these companies are, again, breaking down the barriers between those three disciplines. The company whose led this charge is GE. And it's the company that coined the phrase that, you know, companies might go to bed as industrial businesses, but they wake up as software businesses. And Bill Rue, uh, who is the head of their GE digital division, is pointing out that very same point. That is, in order to remain relevant, you now have to be a software business, a digital business. And therefore, as we rethink the idea of the discipline of market leaders, it's no longer an either-or proposition. In fact, the real market leaders are going to be those companies who find the right blend of product leadership, customer intimacy, and operational excellence in order to uh, respond to the escalating demands of their customers and the intensifying demands of competition. So with that in mind, what I want to do is pass the baton on to Jim so he can talk about what's going on uh, at the ground level, so to speak, the kinds of things that he's, he's seeing uh, from a software monetization point of view and how uh, he and his team are working together with a variety of companies to bring these ideas uh, into fruition. So Jim, I'll let you take it from here. Uh, so, um, as I was saying, you know, a lot of what, what Jeff was talking about really falls in line with the trends that we're seeing in the software modernization market. The impact of the cloud is felt in how companies innovate, uh, which is at a far more accelerated pace uh, than before, how they view customer intimacy, um, and, uh, you know, with ability to understand usage patterns far more thoroughly, how they can actually optimize efficiencies uh, by leveraging a uh, cloud platform. So. Uh, there's no question the cloud is disruptive. It impacts how companies provision, price, and track their offerings. Um, and as with any disruptive technologies, they're both challenges and opportunities. Um, our goal as a business is to assist software publishers in capitalizing on these opportunities uh, while reducing the impact of the disruption. If we think about product innovation, one of the things that cloud licensing allows for is far greater insight into how license features are being used. Uh, in a traditional on-premise model, this sort of information was much harder to obtain and required a lot more effort and cooperation from your end users. Uh, the level of, of intrusiveness and sort of pain associated with trying to get that, uh, you know, uh, information uh, was often a barrier into getting that level of customer insight. Now with license features being controlled with the cloud license server as a business, uh, you really start to understand what features are being used, um, how often. Uh, can some add-on modules be monetized differently? Uh, Jeff gave the Strava example. Well, you know, not only is it a great benefit to him as a cyclist, uh, but if there's certain, you know, there's certain features within Strava that you know uh, the company realizes cyclists are using more often. Uh, maybe focus in on those features a little more. Um, this is um, something, sort of information that pure SaaS offerings have been able to take advantage of by the very nature uh, of their platform. But what cloud licensing does is it extends that sort of advantage to traditional on-premise applications as well. You can actually start to understand you know, how licenses are being consumed, how they're being used, uh, get that sort of intimacy uh, that's uh, much more straightforward for a pure play SaaS vendor, uh, but it's traditionally been much harder for an on-premise application to ascertain. Uh, and needless to say, this sort of business intelligence has a great impact on product innova innovation. It ends up becoming, over time, a gold mine of data that you have available for your product line managers to analyze uh, and make um, product-related decisions on. Now, from an operational standpoint, the ability to deliver and manage licenses to uh, end customers in the cloud has a lot of obvious advantages. Um, it's far less impactful to the end customer. Uh, it doesn't require the installation and configuration of a license manager at the customer site, uh, which no one has ever really liked doing. Uh, but additionally, all the updates, upgrades, uh, new business models uh, that you want to push out uh, can easily be done through a cloud server, uh, just allowing a larger number of end users to immediately benefit from them rather than have to go and reach out uh, to each end customer um, directly. Uh, being able to service them and affect, you know, change their, their licensing terms uh, pushed out through a cloud server uh, just allows you to reach a much broader, not only a much broader audience, but do it in a much less intrusive way. 
uh, being able to deliver, manage, and track licensing from the cloud um, also gives you a, a real opportunity to improve customer intimacy. Uh, what this means is that the end user experience is far more important. If you are leveraging the crowd to get closer to your customers, uh, you need to be much more cognizant of how your customers expect to consume software. Uh, they want greater insight into usage and entitlements. Uh, they feel now that you know through a through a well-designed portal, uh, they can have access to this information, and it should be presented in a much more customer-friendly way. Um, traditionally, licenses have sort of been perceived as a burden to the end user and a possible advantage uh, to the software publisher, uh, but a well-designed portal actually turns that into an advantage for both parties. And that's exactly what we engaged uh, with, uh, or what we had in mind when we engaged with HP. Um, what they wanted to do was focus on a really great customer experience and to make sure that the back-end system supported that. Uh, traditionally, software publishers have built out back-end systems to support the business, and the customer experience becomes a bit of an afterthought. HP focused on three main customer objectives, activation of products, delivery of those licenses, and the overall management of all of your entitlements. Uh, this kind of correlates really well to the three main mantras that Jeff was talking about around product innovation, operational efficiency, and customer intimacy. HP also recognized that by leveraging industry expertise, they were able to greatly improve their own time to market. You know, the focus here was squarely on customer experience and usability, and everything was built around that. Uh, so they leveraged our experience in licensing, in entitlement management, in understanding how customers want to consume that, um, and they brought their expertise in their products, uh, they, what they, they know about their customers, and we were able to kind of combine those uh, to create you know, a, a customer experience that was going to dramatically change the way customers viewed their own licenses and entitlements. Uh, then we worked backwards to figure out how to build in all the supporting infrastructure uh, that helped manage all of that. Uh, one of the nice things about this engagement is that HP has a real nice process by which they measure customer satisfaction over time. Um, and uh, that allows us to take a look at some metrics. Uh, year over year, you can see here uh, the upper purple graph there shows what HP's customer satisfaction was right before they rolled out this new portal. Uh, one year to the date, you see the uh, dramatic shift in numbers, right? Up 56% to 84% in satisfaction um, and dissatisfaction rates uh, uh, down from 44% to uh, as low as 16%. Um, this was a, a great proof point in just what a, a huge impact changing the customer experience had their customers and, and the surveys they, they pushed out uh, validated uh, this uh, premise of starting with you know, a customer portal first and then working backwards from there. So another great case uh, for cloud licensing comes from the medical device industry, where historically internet access has not been a viable option due to security and privacy concerns. Uh, the cost-benefit uh, sort of uh, ratio never really weighed in favor of the cloud uh, up until now. Uh, what the cloud has allowed a company like Stryker is to be able to offer attractive business models like usage-based licensing, um, and that suddenly made cloud licensing not only attractive to Stryker, uh, but to its uh, customers as well. Hospitals and surgeons uh, were able to see uh, the obvious benefits of having a larger variety of business models available to them. Uh, being able to reach uh, devices via the cloud also meant reduced on-site time uh, at these hospitals, uh, which lowered operational costs would actually translate themselves back into more product innovation. Um, it's also allowed Stryker to start exploring expanded market opportunities. Uh, they can introduce license models uh, that allow hospitals to use devices that previously might have been cost prohibitive, uh, but now being able to uh, you know, select certain features or um, scale down versions of the same equipment, uh, they're just able to reach a much larger market. They're able to do it in a much more automated fashion. Uh, the result has sort of been you know, a win for Stryker and a win for their customers. And sometimes a picture tells the story a lot better. Uh, so we've talked a lot about cloud licensing. Uh, this is, you know, not the, uh, this, is, this is sort of a, a nice sort of view as to what this looks like. Uh, this is the Stryker case in particular, but it gives you an idea just for any customer of what the entire end-to-end -end, uh, looks like. Um, you just see, you know, on the, on the left-hand 
side, you've kind of got the internal operational uh, back office systems, you know, sales support, um, the ERP, uh, you know, how you actually kind of uh, manage the, the details of the licensing, which I, I won't bore you with. Uh, but in the, on the lower right-hand side, uh, you see the customer uh, who can, you know, consume product, you know, uh, hardware products, but then actually have the functionality delivered uh, via licenses in the cloud. Uh, in the upper right-hand side, you see Sentinel sitting there kind of forming a bridge between Striker and the customer. Um, and that's the component that traditionally has either, you know, has been kind of split between part of it sits on premise at a customer, at the, at the customer site, you know, with a software publisher tying something real close to ERP, and then something sits at the actual end user site where, uh, you know, uh, uh, the consumer software has to in, install some sort of uh, a license server or manager to, to control all of these licenses, which is why they've traditionally been thought of as uh, a bit burdensome or you know a sort of necessary evil well by by being able to leverage the cloud uh, you've reduced the impact to strikers IT we've reduced the impact to strikers customer systems uh, being able to, and we've also increased the uh, uh, the amount of business models we can we can open up uh, to them because now things like usage and customer patterns all become a much easier reality to deploy uh, so it's really one of those uh, one of those uh, areas where being able to, you know, leverage cloud licensing uh, really is a, it's uh, not to sound cliche, but it's a win-win across the board uh, for all parties involved, uh, uh, both from product insight, uh, license model delivery, customer intimacy, uh, and being able to reduce operating costs. So um, Jeff used the Salesforce example. It's sort of the flagship of uh, how one can achieve all three. Uh, Salesforce is also somewhat unique, and you know they were they they have a really uh, robust SaaS platform, and uh, they have a software offering uh, that lends itself very conducively to being a SaaS platform. That's not the reality for a lot of software publishers, uh, and we recognize that. And so, by being able to to leverage cloud licensing, we're looking to extend a lot of those you know SaaS benefits, if you will, uh, to you know uh, traditional on-premise software or even hardware devices. Uh, something you know as as you know when you think of a medical device you don't think of a, a software company uh, but Stryker thinks of themselves as a software company um, and that's sort of the the interesting thing that cloud licensing allows is a lot of non-traditional if you will uh, companies being able to uh, behave act and think like software companies think in terms of slideware Marcy you might have control as well but that was um, that was the end of the the sessions that I had, so happy to yeah. have to Thank you so much, Jeff. As well. That was amazing for both you and Jeff, very clear. And I, I'm very sorry about the terrible start to the session, but I think we're all clear now. And um, Peter, you have a couple questions that are uh, submitted by by people that maybe you can address to our well, speakers. Well, first, first let me, let me uh, remind everybody that um, there is a very simple interface on your PC that uh, all you have to do is send along your question. And uh, we're going to try and get to as many as we possibly can. Um, and I'd like to kick off with the first question, uh, which is, what are the classic mistakes people make with cloud licensing? I, I know that's pretty broad. Uh, I'm sure, Jam and Jeff, you both have um, hopefully uh, a consensus view on this. Well, let me take the first um, crack at it. and. and Talk in maybe general terms, then jam. You can um, you can uh, drill down a little bit. But I think the first thing that people make a mistake about is uh, is failing to understand that not only are we talking about um, you know an on-demand world that's characterized by the cloud, but increasingly we're talking about a variety of um, of monetization alternatives. So I mentioned shared economy. We referred to subscriptions in the form of software as a service. Um, and obviously, there are a variety of other kinds of hosted uh, capabilities. And the key here is um, that what you need to be able to do is understand you know, the nature of your customers' requirements and their propensity to um, uh, respond to various kinds of packaging and uh, pricing alternatives. 
and ultimately you might have to offer up a variety of alternatives based upon that market segmentation to meet their varying and evolving needs. Uh, so that's why you know, this kind of discussion really revolves around the agility of your software monetization engine to be able to accommodate the various kinds of demands that your customers may in fact have. So it won't be, it's not a singular approach that you have to be thinking about. Jim, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, a spot on, uh, Jeff. I think, the, you know, it's, it's, it is always easy to get carried away with the, with, the, uh, with the latest trends and the new technological toy, as it were. Uh, but uh, it's important to kind of step back and, and look at the uh, look at your customer base uh, and look at you know what what the customer experience is going to be and what the customer benefits are and work backwards from there. Um, you know, uh, looking inwards, there's a lot of operational efficiencies uh, that as a software publisher you can realize uh, via the cloud. But if those don't translate into improvements for the customer, uh, then uh, you know it's, it's it's very hard to to justify. Uh, you know that you've you've reduced operating costs, but customer satisfaction has taken a tumble. So uh, keep it in mind, you know, when you're looking at at a, at a cloud licensing platform, you know, what are the benefits you're looking to realize on this, and being really clear around which area is, is a focused one. Is it is it business intelligence? Is it pushing out a new pricing model that's advantageous to customers? Um, you know, and uh, you, we talked about being able to do all of those three things that you know. Uh, back in the day, we one didn't think was possible, uh, but it's always good to have a priority and figure out what is the main objective that you're looking for out of a out of this new business model, and then build uh, build a phased rollout that keeps those priorities in mind. Jim, I, I, I want to give you an opportunity because there's a difference um, semantically and 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 uh, also in in reality between cloud licensing and using the cloud to have visibility over all of your licenses. And, and you know, they're, they're um, you know, as far as I can tell, the two things that customers want along with the ISVs is visibility over everything. And, and, and a lot of times during mergers and acquisitions, um, you're inheriting an awful lot of licensing and entitlement proprietary systems that you don't have visibility into. And the other one is having the control that you get from getting all the usage information. So I'm going to I'm going to give you an opportunity to give a little pitch on that. Yeah, I'm 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 glad you I'm glad you uh, you asked that Peter because it it is uh, we we tend to use the term cloud very generically. Um, but there are two uh, two aspects of it and and you touched upon both of them. Uh, one is, you know, the cloud uh, as a platform for a software publisher. Uh, being able to, you know, uh, like you said, you know, control all of your licenses when you inherit uh, homegrown technologies or or you acquire companies, uh, you know, funnel them into one entitlement management system uh, where you're able to sort of, you know, standardize on one operating platform um, and being able to use that in the cloud uh, gives you the benefits of just, you know, uh, lower lower IT costs, so all of the benefits of why you would have a hosted IT platform rather than one other thing for, for IT uh, to manage. So, so that's a very um, inward operating advantage uh, for an organization. You know, the, the, the customer isn't as impacted by it. I mean, they are in the sense that the better you're able to understand your entitlements and products, the better the customers are served. Uh, but there's no overt sort of advantage, right? It, it falls into the category of customers just expect that you're going to have all of your operating processes in place. And, and certainly, you know, being able to have an entitlement management platform in the cloud uh, has advantages to the publisher. But when we talk about cloud licensing, that's the ability to actually push out licenses, manage them, control them uh, via a cloud license manager. Um, and that's a completely different piece from the back office systems where all of your uh, you know, uh, product catalogs and all of the relationships between entitlements and products are managed. Uh, cloud licensing allows you uh, to uh, Service a license, manage the manage the entire experience, update license terms on the fly, and uh, now your customers are able to, you know, uh, you're able to offer your customers things like usage-based pricing. You'll be able to track 
uh, their usage. So there's there's a business intelligence component to it. Uh, customers can log in and see how much they've used. So there's greater sort of visibility and transparency to the customers. If you want to open uh, that up to them, uh, you're able to take advantage of managed service providers who want to OEM or resell your products, and you can control the licensing experience without having to give them complete control. Uh, so there's two different, when we talk about cloud licensing, uh, there's the you know, sort of the cloud license uh, manager, if you will, that uh, really allows for better customer intimacy and more product innovation. And then there's just your entitlement platform uh, that you could either have on-premise or host in the cloud uh, that allows for improved operational uh, efficiencies. Okay, somebody, hey. um, uh, the, the I have a question for you, Uh, Peter. I have a question for Jan or or Jeff. I'm not sure if you've seen that came through chat. And it was in regards to uh, the question says, is to speak of optimized pricing models in this context, what should organizations look for when seeking a price optimization solution? I'll let Jim take the lead on that one. Yeah, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, I'm not sure what a price optimization solution is. Uh, I know that there's there's definitely uh, specialists that focus on looking at markets and looking at you know uh, uh, product portfolios and giving guidance on what the right pricing model should be. Um, we yeah, are more right. focused on how to actually enable those and how to deliver on those. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not uh, you know we're not a classic pricing consultancy. House. Uh, one of the things we can offer, though, uh, for folks who, uh, you know, want you know to start thinking around those lines is, you know, when you when you roll out a, a cloud licensing model, um, you don't necessarily need to think just enforcement. You don't need to think of licensing terms. You can start to use uh, licensing just to better understand how your software is being consumed, um, and that can translate its way into uh, updated uh, pricing models. Just just knowing what features are being used, what frequency, what the workflows are. Uh, we've had uh, customers who track licenses in a manner that they, they try to understand with their software um, what's, the, what's the patterns people follow in using different modules uh, to just better understand how their products are actually being used in the field uh, and then translate that back into how they want to price and package differently. So I hope that answered the question. Yep, but that's perfect. I, uh, I, I'm going to jump back in here because um, not that long ago, in fact, only a couple of days ago, we did, with Gamalto's sponsorship, a entire webinar on uh, pricing uh, with um, one of the great subject matter experts um, in the world who talked about exactly the subject the uh, questioner is asking about. And um, if you go to... Um, uh, I'm, I know Mar- Marcy will uh, be delighted in sending you the link if you would, yeah, uh, would like to. Mm-hmm. Take, take the a, take a real picture. Deep. Right. So yeah, yeah no uh, problem. Take a, real deep, take a real deep dive on that. Um, the next question that we have um, is a really good one, and, and I know Mickey's hands. I'm an analog person. Are starting to talk uh, to get to the top of the hour, so I don't want to abuse our privilege of being able to talk with everybody. But somebody wants to know. So how do you get started, and 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 what should you be thinking about in terms of when when have I reached a tipping point in order to be able to say to my management, you know, something we need to go to to a cloud-based licensing solution. How about I take the first crack at that, Jim, and maybe reinforce the point I made before, which is um, the first place to start, of course, is getting a handle on what you're trying to achieve with the software you're developing and delivering, who you're delivering it to, and how you think they're going to most likely consume it. Because that will uh, ultimately influence uh, how you package and price and uh, obviously license that software. And from there, Jam, I'll let you talk in greater detail about some of the mechanics possibly. Yeah, so we we, um, we get asked this question a lot, and um, we've built out a, a services practice uh, around this, uh, which is you know to come in there, and we understand that uh, with uh, with something like licensing, uh, this is just partly technology. It it impacts a lot more uh, than just you know the products that are being licensed. There's an operational aspect. Uh, there's business process involved. 
Uh, it impacts sales support, renewals, customer service. So uh, we take a, a sort of holistic view at what the problems you're trying to solve are and start to work backwards into building this um, uh, you know, technology blueprint, if you will, uh, where you know, we, have, we have consultants who specialize in you know, understanding how to roll out a, an effective kind of licensing program, which means doing an analysis of your product portfolio, understanding your current pricing models, understanding the customer experience. Uh, you know, the, one of the reasons that I, I, I chose to focus on that, uh, on the um, case study uh, for HP, uh, was because the, you know, the, the licensing part of it and the mechanics of getting all of the technology in place uh, was very much just, you know, it was, uh, you know, a lot of hammer swinging, if you will. You know, we we just knew that there were certain things that needed to be done, and uh, that part part of it is very mechanical. It was sitting down with, you know, their customer experience team and the folks that are involved in renewals and and pushing out, you know, um, you know, uh, reaching out to customers to build out this whole portal experience uh, that are centered around what is the right way for their customers, HP's customers, to be consuming uh, a software licensing. So we take this approach of, you know, trying to understand what, you know, what your market is, how you're going to reach your customers, you know, how many of your customers have uh, connectivity, how often do they have connectivity, and help build out a a sort of business case for whether it is the right time now uh, to start thinking about a a cloud licensing model or not. And also, the, <clears throat> there's the critical aspect of getting executive buy-in on this because it used to be that these kinds of things were just IT projects, and now because it involves the customer experience so deeply, this is this you know going back to Jeff's point, this really is a holistic approach that you you know the, that the use case is compelling, but you have to get you have to get the executives in the company to go, you know, licensing and entitlement management is going to be critical to our success going forward. We need to get the right people at the table in order to make the right decision here, right? Yeah, and I exactly. would just, yeah, I would add to that, Peter, we're living in a very dynamic world, so it's not a static thing. And that's again one of the selling points for thinking about using a cloud based um, uh, software licensing and monetization platform to enable you to be responsive um, in today's you know, rapidly changing environment. Okay, so we're we're uh, running out of time here. Uh, we're going to make this like a Broadway show. I need to come out of this session singing the hit tune. Uh, who wants to go first, Jeff? Well, what, what's the, maybe what, I'll, what's the music? What's the yeah, music? The, I need my to chorus sing? line here would be um, in the um, uh, on-demand world that we live in. The best response is building a cloud-based service or cloud-based um, um, service delivery capability to be able to um, keep pace with the dance moves of your customers and um, and competitors, and that's what it's all about when it comes to um, software licensing, monetization, and optimization. I like the way you went with the theme, Jam. <laughs> I, you know the thing that we're hearing with uh, with a lot of customers who are rolling this out successfully is uh, the the mantra seems to be we want to be we want to be easy to do business with uh, you know it's it's not about necessarily having it's always about having the best products and ev everyone's focusing on on being the best in their markets but uh, what uh, what everyone needs to start thinking about now is you know are you as a as a software publisher would your customers say you're easy to do business with. Uh, because that's going to be that's more now than ever. The ability to reach the customer uh, is so dramatically different uh, with the cloud and with cloud licensing uh, that uh, you know think about how easy you are to do business with because that is going to be one of the most significant competitor advantages you can focus on. Um, we'll work backwards from there on how all of this technology fits in, uh, but just keep thinking. You know, am I easy to do business with? How can we be easier to do business with? Um, and I think those will those will uh, lead to positive results. Unfortunately, um, time flies when you're having fun and uh, getting educated, um, and hopefully we managed to do both despite the early hiccup there. Um, first of all, I, I, I know everybody is extraordinarily busy, and we are delighted that you uh, stayed with us through the entire presentation and decided to spend your time with us today. 
a quick reminder about a couple of things, actually, which is, number one, you will be hearing um, from our sponsors uh, uh, shortly as to um, both that uh, pricing uh, webinar that we mentioned, also how to get a copy of the book uh, that Jeff wrote, and as well as how to uh, hopefully um, pass along uh, information about this session to uh, colleagues who may have not been able to join us today. Uh, um, with that said, just I want to thank, wanna thank everybody. I, I want, yeah, go ahead. Peter, it's not a book. It's a white paper. I don't want people to expect a nice so, shiny Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're not, we're, that's true. <laughs> and and, and uh, that's a good catch. Um, anyway, I, uh, I want to thank, obviously, Jeff and Jam and, and, and uh, Think Strategies and Gamalto for allowing them to share their expertise with us today. Uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, our sponsors and our presenters, uh, thanks for joining us and have a great day.